The Day Jesus Crossed the Line, Part 1, The Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign, Day Number 34. Let's all stand for the reading of God's Holy Word, John chapter 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And uh, he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest to drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Holy Father God, we praise you, Lord, and we thank you for your holy word. We praise you and we thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Holy Father God, we thank you most of all for your Holy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is here with us today. And Lord, we individually confess our sins as your Christian people who try to serve you, our faults and our failures. If there's anything not like you inside of us, please take it out. Forgive us of our sins as we from our hearts, by your grace, forgive those who have sinned against us. And Lord, we pray that you would crush and crucify our flesh afresh and anew. Not only this preacher, but Lord, everyone listening here and on our internet campus, on our uh, television campus, on uh, Periscope, Meerkat, wherever they are listening, Spreaker, or on demand. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins, wash us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Fill us afresh and anew with the fullness and the power, the unction and the anointing, the fruit and the liberty of your Holy Spirit. And have your Holy Spirit to work in a mighty fashion, opening up blinded eyes, unstopped deaf ears, and save those who are lost. Rebuke and bind our enemy who is already at work, the devil and the demons of hell, from the preaching of your gospel. Uh, Lord, uh, help everyone to hear and to understand. Glorify your holy name and lift up your son, Jesus Christ, for it is in his name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexander McLaren said, the Samaritan woman, and I love this quote, the Samaritan woman is a fascinating character. 
she is of mature age but now you know there are some women of mature age who look good and uh, so we're not talking about a old lady on a cane there's some older women, there's some mature women who will give some young women a run for their money. And I would imagine this was, uh, uh, this woman was like that. Be that as it may. She is of mature age and has had a not altogether reputable past. We all know women like this. She is frivolous ready to talk with strangers, loves to bat the eye, uh, with a tongue quick to turn grave things into jests, and yet she possesses hidden beneath masses of unclean vanities, a conscience and a yearning for something better than she has. End of quote. And I love that quote. I believe this quote describes her perfectly. But what I want you to get is that you cannot sit back and judge and uh, by looking at people and uh, what their behavior has been and say, oh, they don't want to be saved. She's a prostitute. She's a whore. He's a whoremonger. He's a drug addict. They don't want to be saved. They don't want anything better. They get high every day. Beloved, the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman is one of the most interesting encounters in the Holy Scriptures. Amen, somebody. Amen. And by the grace of God, we're going to park here for a little while. As I said, this is part one. And perhaps even in history, this is one of the most remarkable encounters. It resonates with us today because it touches on many aspects of life that impact society and culture in the modern world. However, for this historic meeting to take place, Jesus had to cross several lines that would have been forbidden to him as a first century Jewish religious leader, a rabbi the day Jesus crossed the line on purpose. Following up on the events of John chapter 3, the gospel writer tells us that Jesus left Judea because he wanted to avoid a conflict with the Pharisees who had heard about his ministry of baptism. Now, you know, Jesus was not running away from conflict. Uh, Jesus caused conflict. Uh, he, when Jesus uh, arrived, either there was going to be a revival, a riot, or a resurrection. You can bank on that. Uh, Jesus was the original mover and shaker. Amen, somebody. Amen. No, he was not running away from a conflict. And God deliver us from Christians who constantly live their lives running away from conflicts. Pastors who hide in their ivory tower offices. Instead of confronting that deacon on the deacon board who needs the board put on him. Who needs to resign. running away from conflict, even from their wives, or from a Jezebel in the church. Uh, 
got the preacher on the run. Running away from conflict. Parents who run away from conflict with their children, their grown children. When they need to say flat-footed and with a serious look on their face, now I love you. Uh, but you can't sit around my house at 29 years old and not work and eat up all my food and commit fornication and uh, uh, look at ungodliness on your computer and on your cell phone and talk to ungodly people in my house raising all kind of hell. You got to go or you got to change. That was free. Jesus was not running away from conflict, but he was working on a divine timetable. Amen, somebody. Amen. He was a man on the move with a purpose. Uh, I can say, if you do not mind what they said about Winston Churchill, he was a young man in a hurry. He didn't have time for foolishness. He had a job to do. And God deliver us also from people who don't understand their mission. They don't understand that they need to be on point. They, uh, they can't lallygag around in life. You need to be on a timetable. God bless the young lady who says, I can't fool around with you, Jimmy Dog. I got something to do. I can't fool around with you, Bo Peep. I have a degree to get. I have a job interview to go to. I have an internship that I got to uh, go to. I'm going to church. Uh, you can go with me, but I'm going to church. I don't have time for foolishness. That's free also. He would have, that is, Jesus would have plenty of run-ins with the Pharisees later. Now, Jesus was on his way to Galilee... But the text tells us that he must needs go through Samaria. And that is where Jesus crosses the first line in his mission to reach the Samaritans with the gospel message. Jesus crossed the line of racial prejudice. And Lord knows we need some preachers, white and black and brown, to cross the line of prejudice, racial prejudice today, even today. If you were a first century Jew reading John's gospel, you would find it odd that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Jews who needed to get from Judea to Galilee or vice versa always took a long, what we would call, bypass to avoid stepping foot inside Samaritan territory. And just like today, there's some white folks who will do everything they can do to avoid going through Adamsville outside of Atlanta. They will stay on 285. They will go around whatever they need to do. There's some black folk who will not go walking through certain parts of Chicago afraid they may not come out. The Jews hated the Samaritans because of their ancestry. 
I want you to get in your mind's eye the map of this area. Here's Jerusalem and Judea down here. And straight through Samaria, you get on the other side, you're in Galilee. There's a little area called Perea on the right-hand side. This was the bypass right here that the Jews would take. Those of you who have driven through Austin, Texas, like I have, you understand. Uh, there's a bypass. There are two of them. There's two bypasses, rather. And if you don't like sitting in traffic, which is at any time of the day in Austin, for it is the Texas town that never goes to sleep. You need to take one of those bypasses. That's what the Jews did here. To not step foot into Samaria. David Guzik provides this helpful summary. When the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom of Ju Judah... They took almost all of the population captive, exiling them to the Babylonian Empire. All they left behind were the lowest classes of society because they didn't want these lowly regarded people in Babylonia, uh, Babylon. These ones left behind uh, intermarried with other non-Jewish peoples who slowly came into the region and the Samaritans emerged as an ethnic and religious group. They called them half-breeds. Back in the day in the south of America they called children born of slave owners and uh, slaves, white and black, mulattoes down in uh, Louisiana. The Jews viewed the Samaritans as unclean half-breeds and Jewish impostors, phonies and fakes. And they, avoided he, uh, and they avoided dealing with them at all costs. So why did Jesus need to go through Samaria? The short explanation is that this was not a geographical necessity, but rather a theological or spiritual necessity, a divine appointment if you will. Jesus, in other words, could have taken the bypass. But he said, no, I have a reason to go through Samaria. I, I have a job to do. I'm on point. I am about my father's business. Amen, somebody. Amen. Jesus went to Samaria because he knew there were people there that needed the gospel, who needed to be saved from sin and hell. He knew that there was this messed up woman who needed new light and new life. To reach her, Jesus crossed the line of racial prejudice. And I want you to see something about Jesus. We just left the wonderful and beautiful third chapter of John. Very instructive, very informative, very powerful. There, Jesus met a man, man named Nicodemus. A man who was considered moral, a leader of the Jews. A man who was educated, well-to-do, looked up to. And now, in the next major scene, Jesus is sitting on a well, talking to a woman, which was not something 
Jewish men, certainly rabbis, did, as I will explain to you back in those days. And a woman of, uh, who had a bad reputation, let's put it that way, she was an outcast. So we see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was concerned about the up and outers and the down and outers. Amen, somebody. Amen. And we in the church ought to be concerned about the same. Everybody needs to be born again. Everybody needs to be saved. Not just the educated and the well-to-do and the rich. Not just the white, but the black as well. Not just the uh, people who are looked up to, but the people who are looked down at. Everybody, everybody needs Jesus. Amen, somebody. Amen. James Cleveland sung a song years ago. Ordinary people. Ordinary people. Ordinary people need the Lord. And then I want you to notice with me, secondly, today, Jesus crossed the line of sexism. John tells us that Jesus entered Samaria and came to a city called Sychar, the region's capital, if you will. It is about midday. Jesus is traveling by foot and he is hot and tired. So he sits down by a well to rest. Yes, Jesus, being Jesus the man, got tired, got weary, got thirsty, had to rest sometimes. But yet, at the same time, he was omnipotent and omniscient. He knew all things. So he knew that he was going to meet this woman that some would call an adulterer and a whore. And there cometh, the Bible says, a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. That's all he said. Jesus had already broken protocol by entering Samaria. He had already crossed the line of going through Adamsville, going through the hood. Now he is speaking to a Samaritan woman. Women in the first century were viewed as second class citizens in a very real sense. A woman of Samaria was viewed as even less, particularly a woman of questionable moral standing. How do we know right from the start that this woman had some issues? We know, beloved, uh, this because she came to the well during midday alone. Historians tell us that women normally went to the well to draw water in groups earlier in the day when it was cooler. The fact that this woman was alone tells us that she was a, if you will, social pariah who had been rejected not only by the community but by other women and or a loose woman who didn't mind being alone in public around loose men. Probably both are true here. Either way, Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, as he was called by Nicodemus, should not have been talking to her according to the rules of the day. Jewish rabbis didn't even talk to Jewish women in public. Now do not think this is strange. 
Brother Platt of the Southern Baptist Convention Mission Organization. Billy Graham. We thank God for Billy Graham. And we thank God that there are no scandals in his life as far as being involved with a, another woman other than his wife. And bless his heart, he remained single after his wonderful wife died. And never a peep. And one of the reasons is Billy Graham and his co-workers had a rule. Never to be seen talking to a woman at a hotel or uh, being alone in a room with a woman. And some criticized them for taking it too far, even using this passage of scripture. But all we know, Billy Graham is not Jimmy Swaggart. And we thank God for that. Because Billy Graham understands that he's not Jesus either. And uh, I think it's a good rule for us. Uh, but we ought to be able to pass out a gospel track to a Samaritan woman. Uh, we ought to be able to witness to a Samaritan woman of today down at Times Square. Uh, just make sure you don't say something stupid like, uh, why don't you come back to my, uh, my, my hotel room and we can finish this conversation. No, 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 don't do that. You want to avoid the appearance of evil. And some men who have had a past, uh, they don't need to uh, talk to uh, some women at all. You're not Jesus, sir. Talk, talking about, I can handle talking to the women and counseling my uh, women in the uh, office. No, you can't. You need your wife there. You need other women there. You need to build an office with, with, with glass windows. I mean, with, with windows so, so people can see through. William Barclay, be that as it may, William Barclay said the strict rabbis forbade a rabbi to greet a woman in public. A rabbi might not even speak to his own wife or daughter or sister in public. You see this, that, that, that's, that's strange, no? Well, uh, when I travel, my daughters sit in the back. We want to avoid the appearance of evil. And they don't mind it. I don't mind it. It, it, it. It's just better that way. It's not that they can never sit up front. I'm sure there might be occasion, but we just don't do that. So think it not strange. There were even Pharisees who were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. Now we don't. We don't do this. They were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees because they shut their eyes when they saw a woman on the street and so walked into walls and houses. That's taking it too far. Uh, but think it not strange. I have a dear preacher friend over in Germany. He invited me to preach several times over in Germany. I'm not going to tell you the city. But he was raising his children. God blessed them with ten children. They may have more now. And when he would take me out to eat and he would take his boys with him, and they would be in the van and a voluptuous woman would be walking down the street and he had a signal. He said, all right boys, And I didn't know what was going on. And I just turned around and these boys, they covered their eyes so as not to look at the voluptuous fine woman. 
And uh, I was sitting over there in the passenger's seat, and I, I saw the woman. And I said, well, brother, praise the Lord. As long as you don't close your eyes, we'll be all right. The Samaritan woman herself, ladies and gentlemen, expressed a surprise when Jesus spoke to her. She said, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus' disciples were all so shocked when they got back from buying meat and found Jesus talking to this woman. They said, oh man, what's going on here? The Bible says they marveled that he talked with uh, the woman at the well. Jesus crossed the line of sexism, putting down women, making them second-class citizens, like they're nothing. Sexism in his culture in order to reach this woman, he put it down. He put down sexism in his culture to reach this woman of ill repute. The point here, beloved, is that Jesus wanted to reach everybody with the gospel, even the people whom his own Jewish race thought were unworthy or less than others. Beloved, Jesus crossed the line. And Jesus crossed the greatest barrier of all in his mission to save such wretched, wicked, evil, and ungodly people as we are. And that is the barrier of sin between us and God. A barrier that said we did not deserve to be saved. In fact, we deserve an eternal hell. Think about that for a moment. But Jesus Christ came down to us from heaven because God loved us and did not want us to be eternally separated from him. Therefore, Jesus crossed the line. Amen, somebody. After all that he has done for us, we must make the decision to trust him and believe on him as the Samaritan woman eventually did. Here's how you can be saved right now, just like the woman of ill repute from Samaria. First, dear friend, please understand that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's law. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not only the Samaritan woman, but you. You might be a whore. You might be a whoremonger. You might be a liar. You might be a cheat. You might be rebellious and stubborn and proud. You might be a thief. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As the music plays, come to Jesus. For he will save you right now. Please understand, beloved, that because of your sins, you deserve eternal punishment in that awful place called hell. And so do I. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. This includes both physical death and spiritual death. We die physically because of sin and we die spiritually because of sin in a place called hell. I know that that is bad news, but I have some good news for you today. Jesus Christ, this same Jesus, said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that includes you, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
the phrase, for God so loved the world, means that if you are in this world, God loves you no matter what you have done. Even if you're a whore and a whoremonger. The next phrase that he gave, his only begotten son, refers to Jesus Christ. He is God's only begotten son who suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins and for mine. And he was buried and rose again on the third day. Our next phrase is that whosoever believeth in him. The word whosoever means anybody at any time. The phrase believeth in him means to trust in him, to depend upon him, to rely on him or to have faith in him for your salvation. It's very simple, folks. God did not make it hard for us. Our next phrase, should not perish, refers very simply to eternal punishment in a place called hell forever. And lastly, the phrase, but have everlasting life, means to live forever in heaven with God instead. The Bible also says in Romans 10, 9 and verse 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou you shalt be saved for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved saved from what saved from hell you can get saved today like the Samaritan woman no matter who you are no matter where you are and no matter what you have done Dear friend, if you are willing to believe right now in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, please pray with me this simple prayer called the Sinner's Prayer. Believing in your heart that Jesus Christ died for you, was buried, and rose again. Repeat after me, phrase by phrase, and come to Jesus. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. And that I have broken your laws. And that I deserve hell. For Jesus Christ's sake, please have mercy and grace upon me. And forgive me of all of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ died for me. Was buried. And rose again. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul and change my life and help me to be the Christian that you want me to be. Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake, amen. Dear friend, if you believed in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again, allow me to say to you congratulations on doing the most important thing in life, and that is trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, go to gospellightsociety.com and read what to do after you enter through the door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Dear friend, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior today, please email me at dw3 at gospellightsociety.com and let us know. We have some free material that we want to send you. If you have a prayer request, please email that to me as well, and we will pray for you until you tell us to stop. God loves you, we love you, and may God bless you real good as we sing.